This is my colleague, Monajit Majumdar. He is the editor of uh, the explained page in that goes every day in the paper. And, okay. uh, and Good evening, Good evening Dr. Kumar Swami. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank Absolutely. you for having me. Yeah, yeah. So we'll start in a, in a couple of minutes, I guess. In a yeah, yeah. About, about a minute. Six o'clock, we'll yeah. start. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll introduce you. I'll just introduce the topic and you, Dr. Kumaswamy, and then we can start the questions. We'll have about 40 minutes, and then okay. uh, we can take questions from the floor. Sure, sure, sure. Monajit, sir, you can start. Yeah, okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to a new edition of the Indian Express Explained Live, uh, our series of online explanatory conversations with domain experts and authorities on specific subjects. I am Monojit Majumdar, editor for explanatory journalism at the Indian Express. Today, we are discussing Sri Lanka, as all of you know, uh, where an extraordinary economic crisis has plunged the nation into chaos, triggered mass street protests, and ultimately forced the Rajapaksa brothers out of power. The streets are relatively calm now, and the IMF has recently concluded a staff level agreement with Sri Lanka for a $2.9 billion bailout. But the road ahead remains extremely uncertain. So how did the situation in Sri Lanka, which was a relatively prosperous country by South Asian standards, come to this pass? Uh, when did the crisis begin and, and why? To answer some of these questions and to generally explain the situation in Sri Lanka today, we are very honored to have with us here Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy, an eminent economist and the former governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Dr. Kumaraswamy, thank you for your time. We are very grateful to have you. Thank you very much for having me. Speaking to Dr. Kumaraswamy will be my colleague, strategic affairs editor Nirupama Subramanian. Nirupama is an old Sri Lanka hand who has reported from the country for many years and who has been tracking the developments there very, very closely indeed. You can read all of Nirupama's reporting on our website, www.inanexpress.com, and listen to her on the Indian Express podcast, Three Things. Today's explained event is brought to you by our associate partner, Yojana IES. My thanks to our partner. And thank all of you for joining and welcome once again. Nirupama. Uh, thank you, Monoji. Thanks a lot. Um, I will just briefly um, um, introduce Dr. Kumar Swami. You've, you've done most of it already, but I'll just add a few details about him. Uh, Dr. Kumar Swami, um, after finishing his uh, studies in England, Dr. Kumar Swami uh, joined the uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Uh, in 1973, he was a staff, le staff level officer um, at um, the Central Bank until 1989. And um, during this period, he also served, he was seconded to the Ministry of uh, Finance in Sri Lanka. And um, from 1990 to 2008, uh, the next two decades, basically, he was uh, at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. And in 2016, uh, during uh, a change of government, uh, there was uh, the Rajapaksa, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa had been voted out of power, a new government was in place. Uh, uh, President Maithripala Sirisena and uh, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, and they invited him back to the country to head the central bank. And then in 2019, when uh, President, uh, when Gotabaya Rajapaksa was elected president, he stepped down again. And um, so that's uh, that's basically uh, his, um, uh, you know, his career this, at the Central Bank. I can't help uh, mentioning a very small interesting nugget about him, which is that uh, he just wanted me to say that he, you know, he's ex-governor of uh, Central Bank. But I 
wanted to say also that he has an interesting India connection. His uh, his grandfather was High Commissioner to India from 1950 to 1955. So that's. Um, that's a little secret about him, <laughs> <laughs> little known secret <laughs> or little known fact. Um, so um, uh, Monajit has already set the stage and I think uh, because time is short and you know there are going to be lots of questions, I'm going to plunge into the questions straight away, Dr. Kumaraswamy. Um, can I ask you first to tell us um, what this economic situation is uh, right now in Sri Lanka, what are its forex reserves as of September? How many months of imports is that good for? And why uh, why are there no queues anymore? I mean, we are not seeing that many queues. Is that just a, a function of better uh, management, or uh, what is it? Is the crisis still as bad as it was um, some months ago? Because the money hasn't yet come from the IMF. So let me start. Uh, let me start by thanking um, you, uh, Imanujit, for for your generous introductions and Indian Express for having me on this program. It's a great pleasure. Um, let me give you first the kind of factual answer to the question you asked me, which is the, the reserve level. The reserve level, the gross external reserve level, is about 1.8 billion, just under 1.8 billion US dollars. But 1.4 billion of that is a swap arrangement with the People's Bank of China, which is not very usable. There are conditions. You've got to have three months worth of import cover before you can draw on that. So of the re usable reserves are only about 300 million. Of that, about 100 million is SDR holdings with the IMF and a little bit of gold that is left after the selling of some of the gold stocks the central bank had. So actually it's about 200 to 300 million. That's all the reserves. That exists, and that's about, I would say, about a week's one week's our uh, imports um, uh, currently amount to about 1.5 billion after all the restrictions and the policy interventions. Uh, so we're talking really not, not more, much more than a week's, uh, less than a week's uh, import cover. So that's the reserve level. But the situation actually has improved at one level, but remains extremely challenging and fragile at another. So let me start with a, with a positive scenario which is that you know, the queues for fuel and gas, cooking gas, et cetera, have largely disappeared. The power outages, which at the peak were 10, 12 hours, are now down to one, two hours. And food supplies are basically available, but affordability is a, is a, is a significant challenge with food price inflation running over 90% and overall inflation uh, close to 70%. But again, there is a positive narrative um, uh, which is emerging, and that is that the rate at which inflation has been rising is coming down. And in fact, the central bank governor in a press conference he gave a couple of days ago is of the view that we are now near the peak of the inflation and the various measures taken into account, including very aggressive tightening of monetary policy through increase in the policy rates of the CBSL by about 700 basis points, all that is beginning to take hold. As you know, monetary policy uh, becomes effective after a transmission lag. So we are beginning to see um, inflation flattening out, uh, but you know, from an extremely high level and, and affordability on the food front, the serious problem. So how, do, how, how have these improvements come about in terms of uh, fuel and uh, of, uh, um, cooking gas, et cetera, the queues have gone, et cetera. And there, it's a combination both of policy measures as well as better administration on the ground. You, you gave me two possible um, sets of causal of factors. In terms of policy measures, um, import restrictions have banned everything except the most essential, essential imports now. Um, on top of that, the currency depreciation, the interest rate increase, the tax increases, all of that is compressing demand and bringing down imports. Um, and then on the, on, the, uh, on the other side, in terms of improving the administration, the management on the ground, a QR-based rationing system has been brought in for fuel, which has been working quite effectively. So for various reasons, what has happened is that there is now a better balance 
between the the, the, the demand uh, and and the and, and the supply of essential essential um, goods. Um, now, if you look at um, uh, the <coughs> imports and exports, exports are currently running about 1.2 billion US dollars. Inward remittances, worker remittances are running at about 350 million dollars. So that together is about 150 million. There's a little bit of money coming into the Colombo Stock Exchange, and there's a little bit of portfolio capital coming into the government securities, uh, but these are very small amounts. But altogether, that broadly matches the import bill of about 1.5 billion per month. So the, the, the liquidity, the dollar illiquidity has been balanced at a very low equilibrium. Because normally imports are in excess of two billion dollars a month, so this the pressure is off in terms of essentials uh, because of the the measures that have been taken to bring about this low level equilibrium. But that is the kind of positive side to it. But the negative side is these measures to reduce inflation has meant that the economy is expected projected to contract by over 8%. The IMF says 8.7%. The World Bank says 9.4%. That is contraction during the course of this year. In addition, the World Bank in a recent report that's come out just a couple of days ago says that the number, the uh, poverty ratio has doubled to 25% between 2020 and 2021. Sorry, between 2021 and 2022. So the poverty ratio has doubled. About two and a half million people have slipped below the poverty line. So while, as I say, the queues have gone, um, you know, the protests have, well, there are some protests even now, but not at the scale we had earlier. Uh, but what is happening is that you, you have a contraction of the economy and you're having an increase in poverty. So those are really longer term challenges which have to be resolved. So the government has to get, move from a staff level agreement to a full EFF program as fast as possible. In order to do that, it has to get a debt restructuring package uh, agreed. Uh, all that has to happen. And at the same time, you have to have a plan for a recovery for in the medium to long term in terms of getting the growth trajectory going again. Yeah, so you mentioned the debt restructuring um, issue here and how that would have to be sorted out before it moves on to an uh, EEF program. Uh, so what is the progress on that? Because um, the, we heard that Japan was willing to uh, organize these uh, debt restructuring talks. We also heard that China uh, did not want to participate with uh, the others in these talks and that it would have its own independent um, consultations with uh, Sri Lanka on debt restructuring. We heard India say that there has to be, uh, the debt restructuring has to have a certain measure of equality. Um, so what are all these, I mean, how will all these challenges play out? Um, okay. And Because this is one of the conditions uh, for the IMF to uh, move Sri Lanka yes. into the EEF. Yes. So let me say this. Before I go on, I should have said something in response to the first question, and that is to acknowledge the value of the tremendous assistance that the government of India and the Reserve Bank of India gave to Sri Lanka. 4.8 billion US dollars worth of assistance has been given uh, as emergency assistance. And this has been crucial, crucial in really putting a bottom to the crisis. Things would have been significantly worse, but for this 4.8 billion that uh, the government of India and the RBI has generously given to the people uh, and government of Sri Lanka. So to answer your second question, um, the uh, the government has been saying that there has to be radio silence on the details of the debt restructuring. But from outside, I think one can say that progress has been made, but a long, there is a long, long road ahead. Um, what, uh, you see, what, in order to get the EFF, there are two things that have to happen. Uh, one is the official creditors need to give an indication or at least reassurance of financing. What they need to do is to say that they are willing through debt relief or other means to provide sufficient liquidity for Sri Lanka to get back on the path towards debt sustainability. So assurance of financing from the bilateral creditors. 
Then from the commercial creditors, what needs to happen to have finalized the EFF is that there has to be an indication of good faith negotiations going on between the commercial creditors and the government of Sri Lanka. So those are the two things. That is the bar one needs to clear to be able to get the uh, executive board of the IMF to consider the staff level agreement and then finalize it. And for the IMF money to be disbursed. And once that happens, other money will get triggered. But in terms of progress, as I said, there is nothing uh, which is readily available in the public domain. But as far as I know, um, there are contacts now taking place between the bilateral donor countries and the government of Sri Lanka. And what the government would like to do is to have a common coordination platform to get the Paris Club members who are the traditional donor countries, basically the West plus Japan, and the non-Paris Club members, namely India and China, at the same coordination platform. Because then everybody knows what the government is offering everybody else. And there is then a far less chance of any suspicion uh, and or you know that be it'll, it'll be a much more transparent and open process. So this is what Sri, Sri, the Sri Lankan government is now working on, getting everybody onto this common platform on the bilateral credit. And they will, I think, they've had contacts with the advisors uh, to the commercial creditors. Um, uh, I think Rothschild is uh, and and uh, White and Case, the lawyers, they are advising one creditor group, a large one accounting for a little over half the, the commercial credit outstanding. And so those processes are going on. Um, there is no indication that they have hit a roadblock as yet. But at the same time, it is still very early days. So can you tell me, I mean, this 2.9 billion is not really enough of a package. I mean, it's going to be spread out over 48 months. Uh, you mentioned commercial uh, creditors. So one of the things that having this uh, agreement with the IMF this, um, uh, will do is signal to commercial creditors that uh, Sri Lanka is is it's okay to lend to Sri Lanka again in a sense. So that is that's going to be very important, right? I mean that you have to approach Sri Lanka has to approach commercial uh, lenders again, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, one thing is Sri Lanka as a middle income country um, lost access to concessional official development assistance, foreign aid, basically. Now, there is some talk that they may have a reverse graduation to be able to access concessional money. But as things stand now, there is no access to concessional money. So, the, as you correctly pointed out, the IMF money is useful, but you know it, it's necessary, but far from sufficient. Um, so for that reason, but, but it is a kind of good housekeeping skill, uh, seal, which will catalyze other money. It will catalyze money from other multilaterals like the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and hopefully some bilateral donors. And over time, it may take a little bit of time, but say within a years or so, of the uh, debt final agreement uh, on the debt uh, uh, relief, Sri Lanka could access markets again. Because Sri Lanka had, a, had an excellent reputation, <clears throat> I wouldn't say excellent, but had a good reputation in international capital markets. It was considered to be good for its money. I, I, as to, uh, to really demonstrate that, I don't know whether you remember, there was a constitutional crisis in the last quarter of 2018. You know, and there were, there were pictures going all around the world about the goings on in parliament and all that kind of thing, things happened. But three months after that constitutional crisis, Sri Lanka was able to go to the market and raise 2.4 billion US dollars um, because there was a belief that Sri Lanka was committed to meeting its debt and that it was capable of managing its debt. Equally, two months Two months after the Easter bombing, in June uh, 2019, the Sri Lanka went to the capital markets again because elections were coming up. And at that time, the authorities, and I was also there at the time, authorities felt that whenever election come, elections come, things get a bit chaotic and that 
we would may have difficulty in accessing markets for a little bit of time. So we decided to collect as much money as possible to have a bit of a buffer. So just two months after the Easter bombing, Sri Lankan government was again able to go to the market and raise another two billion. So three months after the consumer crisis, 2.4 billion, and just six months after the consumer crisis and two months after the Easter bombing, we were able to raise two billion. So Sri Lanka's reputation in international capital markets for that we were good for our money and we were very committed uh, in terms of meeting our obligations. However, for various reasons, the pandemic and some policy mistakes, uh, we, we have got into the situation we're in now, whereby we've had to announce a debt standstill. So we should be able to get back to the markets again, provided we are able to implement the um, provisions in the staff level agreement and eventually the EFF. Uh, and also side by side with that, we need to do the structural reforms to get growth recovery going. So could you um, explain to us what these conditionalities are? I mean, going by the staff level agreement and uh, course, when the extended fund facility comes, uh, will the condition, conditions be different for that or will the same conditions continue, I mean, as put out in the staff level agreement? Because not much of the conditionalities have come in the public domain, uh, I think. I mean, there, there were a few, but uh, not all yeah, of them so, were put out. Yeah. I mean, the detail uh, has not been put out, but the different elements of the program are in the public domain. And, and, and the key elements are, one is fiscal consolidation. As you know, there were these tax cuts which were implemented in, in uh, December 2019, which undermined fiscal stability. And on top of the tax cuts, the effects of the pandemic also kicked in. And therefore revenue uh, dropped to 8% of GDP when our expenditure was about 20%. And this, uh, because there was nothing else that could be done, the central bank was forced to print vast amounts of money, deficit financing, basically, of a very, very large order, which, of course, kicks into inflation and things, other things that we are seeing now, and even balance of payments pressure. Um, so uh, that is, has to be put right. So we have to have a revenue enhancements-based fiscal consolidation. The government has already introduced a number of fiscal measures to increase, increase revenue. Um, and I think more will be announced in the budget speech in November 2022, when the next year's budget uh, will be will be uh, announced to Parliament and the country, and then there'll be a debate. So I mean, so that is one thing, right? Fiscal consolidation, particularly on the revenue side, a lot has been done, and more needs to be done. And the, and the the key operating target is that the primary surplus in the budget. That is, if you take total revenue and deduct all expenditure except interest payments, then you get the primary balance. Now, Sri Lanka has had only three years since 1954 when the primary balance was positive. Because if the primary balance is positive, you don't have to add on to your debt stock because you're meeting your expenditure out of the revenue for the year. But when it's a negative, you're keeping adding on to the debt stock. So we've only had three years like that. And two of those years were 2017 and 2018. 2019, again, there was slippage and subsequently further slippage. So the target in the EFF, remember we've only done three years since 1954. The target in the EFF is to move from a projected 4% deficit in the primary balance this year to a surplus of 2.3% in 2025. So a 6.3% turnaround in the primary balance over three years. So that is a very tough ask. And so there will have to be, and there are already some measures have come in and more will come in. And that fiscal turnaround is at the heart of the EFF. Um, then the other thing is, and here quite a lot has already been done, to have cost recovery-based pricing for fuel and electricity. A lot has already been done. I think a bit more has to be done on electricity, but movement has already happened. Then to strengthen social protection, even the IMF has said that given the pain that the people are suffering already, and given the pain that is still in the pipeline as further tax and other measures are introduced, that there will have to be a ramping up of the social protection program significantly. As I said, you know, the poverty level has doubled 
uh, in one year. So this is a very high priority and the government is giving high priority to this. And even the donor develop, uh, and partners are doing so. The, uh, already the World Bank and the ADB and other donors are repurposing existing loans to, 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 build, to strengthen the social protection and more will have to be done. And we have to improve the targeting uh, uh, and design of the social cash transfer program. We have the Samurdi program, which is the main cash transfer program. It is highly politicized and people who should, shouldn't be getting it are getting it and people who should get it don't get it because of the politicization. So one, uh, an academic, uh, Professor Delaney Gunawardner at the Peradeni University has suggested, I, I think a very good way of identifying the target group. And that is to look at electricity consumption. 98% of households in Sri Lanka are linked to the national grid. So you can see electric consum consumption of the whole population pretty much. So if you have a threshold uh, below which you're going to give support, that's an objective, clean way of doing it. And also like India, we need to get our, you know, we've been working on a digital ID for some time. We need to get our digital ID going. And like the ADA scheme, we need to use that digital ID to transfer the money directly into the accounts of the beneficiary so that the leakages can be, can be reduced uh, and administration costs can be also uh, brought down. So that's another big area of reform that has to happen and has to happen urgently given the pain that the population, at least the bottom 50, 60% of the income distribution is experiencing at the moment. And the other thing is to restore price stability, to bring inflation down through data-driven forward-looking monetary policy. The central bank was even before the crisis, before the pandemic, was uh, rolling out a flexible inflation targeting uh, uh, framework for monetary policy. And that had already been revived. And the new governor who was senior deputy governor earlier and, his, and was the person who actually oversaw that transition process is back in office and he knows that better than anybody else. And he is putting that into place. And this is why we are beginning to see inflation coming under control. And that has to be, I think, uh, uh, reinforced. And we need to have this data-driven, forward-looking monetary policy, which takes place within an inflation targeting framework. And we cannot have it politicized as it was. We can't have this kind of industrial scale deficit financing that went on. And, and also uh, the financial repression, artificially keeping interest rates down. It doesn't work. We've done it time and again over the years. Uh, it, and each time it, it leads to instability. So we have to clean that, all that up for monetary policy. The other thing is to rebuild reserves through using a flexible um, market determined exchange rate. Uh, and that also quite a lot has been done. A little bit more needs to be done uh, on that front. Um, then safeguarding the stability of the financial system. Now the banks, um, at one point before the crisis, the banks were well capitalized and had good liquidity ratios. But because of the increase in non-performing loans as a result of the economic contraction, and also the fact that because the government had no fiscal space of its own, it used the bank to protect livelihoods uh, and businesses uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the, if you look at Sri Lanka's fiscal stimulus during the pandemic, it was the smallest in the South Asia region. Though can, the country uh, has, I think, after Mall, this is the second highest per capita income. Despite that, very small fiscal stimulus, no fiscal space. Banks had to take the load. On top of that, now the economy is contracting. Uh, and so they need, the central bank is, has started a diagnostic uh, looking at the capital adequacy of banks, the nine um, systemically important banks, and they need to be well capitalized and the system needs to be stable. Um, the, the other thing is uh, they've talked about is, is uh, reduction of corruption vulnerability. This has now become very, as you know, a high profile uh, issue. Um, it's emerged in Geneva as well. Um, and here, the things that are required are one, to improve fiscal transparency, uh, and also uh, strengthen public financial management. Then also to introduce a, a stronger anti-corruption framework, which is well aligned with the UN Convention on Corruption. And finally, to conduct uh, an in-depth governance diagnostic, 
with IMF technical assistance. So these are the things that need to be done in, in the area of strengthening governance on the financial side. So those are those are really the key elements of the IMF. So you mentioned the role of the central bank. Um, when this crisis was brewing in uh, 2020 uh, 20 and in 2021, uh, can you take a, you know, can you look back and tell us what the central bank was doing, what it was asked to do at that time, and how that um, kind of uh, seemed to have exacerbated the crisis? Would you be able to tell us in briefly about that? Yes, yes. So a couple of things. One is with the tax cuts and the very sharp reduction in revenue, uh, the only way salaries and pensions could be paid, the only way eventually when the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation ran short of <clears throat> dollars, the only way they could have rupees to buy dollars, et cetera, was with the central bank printing the money, essentially. Uh, and as you know, if you print that, level, that those amounts of money, you have A, inflation, and B, some of the aggregate demand created by that excess money leaks into imports and puts pressure on the balance of payments and the currency, et cetera. So that's one, one line of instability, uh, which is associated with the central bank's policy at that time. This is out of this deficit financing or in common parlance, money printing. The second thing is the, um, the, the strategy, the alternate strategy adopted in those years, uh, 2020, 2021, um, drew heavily from the East Asian uh, model. And as you know, in the East Asian model, uh, the cost of funds were kept very low. Uh, but they were able to keep the cost of funds low by having very strong macroeconomic fundamentals. Their budgets were in balance. Um, their monetary policy was forward-looking and data-driven. And so the, the low cost of funds came from strong macro fundamentals. They were not artificially created by financial repression. If you have, if you, if you achieve, if you drive the cost of funds down through financial repression, you end up essentially overheating the economy. You have stuff, uh, credit growth picks up uh, and, and it leaks into uh, imports and also it puts pressure on the prices. So those were the two channels through which the central bank's actions proved to be counterproductive. That is deficit financing and financial repression. And the central bank, as I said, played a, but here it's a positive role, a positive role in providing protection to livelihoods and businesses uh, uh, during when the pandemic hit, because the government didn't have the fiscal space to do it. And there the central bank stepped in and played a very important role. Why did the government uh, put off this decision to go to the IMF? Um, I mean, by uh, common wisdom has it that they should have gone last year to the IMF. What were the reasons that, I mean, no country likes to go to the IMF, but were there any specific reasons uh, for Sri Lanka not to do that? A, a couple of reasons. Now, um, you know, the High Commissioner, Sri Lanka's High Commissioner to Delhi at the moment, His Excellency Milinda Morogoda, founded a, a think tank called the Pathfinder Foundation. And that think tank put out a report in, I think, May 2020, after the pandemic hit, in terms of a roadmap uh, to, to on, on the way ahead. And that report very clearly said that the government of Sri Lanka should approach the IMF. So this was something that was put out in May 2020. And that report was actually given to all three of the Rajapaksa brothers. It was handed over to each of them um, by the, the chairman of the Pathfinder Foundation, you know, Ambassador um, Bernard Gunatulaka, who actually served in Delhi at one time, uh, and the principal author, uh, Dr. Ganeshan Vigman. They went around and gave it to all three of them and talked about the report. Uh, but anyway, it, it, the government went in a different direction, in a different, what they call an alternate strategy. Uh, why did they not go? One is because of ideology. They, they felt that the IMF's um, approach was not correct, uh, and they preferred this East Asian report, but uh, East Asian model. 
the East Asian model, I have a lot of sympathy for it, but you have to take all of it. And part of it is very strong macroeconomic fundamentals. You have to have a strong macroeconomic fundamentals as a foundation for everything else. So if you can't take bits and pieces and not if without macroeconomic fundamentals, it doesn't work. And that's what we are finding now. The, the um, other thing is um, the IMF cannot transact uh, with country, member countries where it deems that debt is unsustainable. Now, way back in April, I think it was April 2020, the IMF introduced a new facility for the Rapid Finance Initiative to help countries with dollar liquidity, uh, with, with low conditionality, uh, immediately after the pandemic hit. And I think close to over 90 countries were helped through that facility. Sri Lanka applied for assistance under that facility, but that assistance didn't materialize. And the only reason that could have been could, that could have been is that the IMF at that time itself had deemed that debt to be unsustainable. Uh, they didn't publicly say it because then you know you can have a self-fulfilling prophecy of the crisis getting hit, hitting the country. So they didn't say it publicly, but that must have been the only reason. Otherwise, there's no reason why Sri Lanka couldn't have drawn eight hundred so million dollars. This was soon after the tax cuts, then. Yes, exactly. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good point you're making, because the, the, the government of Sri Lanka, the previous government, the Yahapana government, also had an EFF facility, which uh, started in 2016, and it it was going on when the government changed. There was still another six months to go. One more, one more. Uh, tranche to be received. And on the 1st of November, the executive board of the IMF considered, I think, the fifth or sixth review under that previous EFF and released a tranche of money to the government of Sri Lanka. The fact that it did so must um, uh, mean that the IMF at that time thought Sri Lanka's debt was sustainable. It was fragile, no doubt, but it was considered sustainable. So between November 1st and April, May, the IMF of uh, November 1st, 2019 and April, May, 2020, the IMF's perception of Sri Lanka's uh, credit worthiness, that sustainability changed. Uh, so the tax cuts would have been a large part of the story and the pandemic hitting and tourism getting Smashed, etc. That that would so it, it's a mix of things, uh, both both the effects of the pandemic as well as the tax cuts. And can you unpack for us uh, also the decision to default? Uh, it was taken this um, April, and um, it seemed to have been a considered decision because I think the thinking uh, was that uh, it will smoothen the path. Uh, uh, for an agreement with the IMF. So how did that how does that work? Can you can you explain that a bit? Sure. I mean, you know, uh, there has been some debate on this on the, about the, the merits of the uh, announcement of a debt standstill. Um, but but the arguments against it, I, I, in my view, have no merit because on the twelfth of April of this year. When the debt standstill was announced by the government of Sri Lanka, the finance minister at the time announced that the reserves were 20 million US dollars or less, the usable reserves. That is not counting the, the PBOC, uh, PBOC uh, uh, swap, which was not usable, just 20 million dollars. And about five days after the debt standstill was announced, there was a coupon payment due on an international sovereign bond of about, I think, 160 or 170 million dollars. And there was no money to pay it because the, the banks, Sri Lankan banks were having difficulty in getting any credit lines. The, the, the foreign banks were very reluctant or did not want to increase their exposure uh, to uh, Sri Lanka, the particular sovereign. So all this meant that there was just, the money had dried up and the, the government in October 2021 
announced a roadmap for October 2021 to March 2022, where it had identified various sources of financing that would come into the country. But that didn't really materialize, and which is why the reserves were down to the level they were at. So there was absolutely no choice but to announce a standstill because our reserves had run down to the, as I said, about 20, usable reserves had run down to 20 million. And there were obligations coming up. There were, you know, I think, I think at that time, probably there was still about $4 million worth of obligations for the rest of the year. And there was about 160, 70 million coming up within a few days. So there was no choice but to do that, to announce the debt that standstill. And what the debt standstill uh, did was to uh, identify a perimeter for the debt that would be treated under the, the relief. Um, so it, it included uh, bilateral debt, um, both from Paris Club donors as well as non-Paris Club. And it also included commercial debt, the international sovereign bond, uh, the, 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 the Sri Lanka development bonds, that is a <laughs> locally issued dollar bond. All those were within the perimeter. What was excluded was multilateral uh, debt from, that is debt from the IMF, World Bank, ADB, et cetera. Uh, and uh, 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 things like trade credits, swap arrangements from the central banks, and any debt that was issued after the 12th of April. So the, the now one of the concerns that is the reason is what about this 4.8 billion that India has given Sri Lanka? Is that going to be restructured? Now, my understanding, of course, I'm not, I'm not an official spokesperson anymore. As a person from the outside, my understanding is that debt would be outside the perimeter because it has taken the form of uh, trade credits, uh, a swap arrangement from the RBI, um, and some of it was given after the 12th of April, and any debt um, incurred after the standstill date would also not be within the perimeter for debt which was going to be treated. So these are all outside. But having said that, now that in my, from what I know, is the current official position of the government of Sri Lanka. But the government of Sri Lanka can't guarantee this because in the end, the whole debt debt relief package has to be agreed with the creditors. So the creditors must also agree. So you can't give a cast iron guarantee that this is going to be excluded. But the position of the government of Sri Lanka is that they want this excluded, these categories of debt excluded. So the 4.8 billion that India has given, um, for as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, has to be excluded from the restructuring. You know, as I say, I say this. I say this as a non-official uh, commentator from the outside, not as a government person anymore. Yeah. Right. You spoke about a contraction in the economy that's going to be inevitable. Um, so, when can Sri Lanka actually uh, hope for a recovery? I mean, uh, I know that Prime Minister, sorry, President Ranil Vikramasinghe has uh, tentatively said that. By 2024, uh, Sri Lanka should be um, should be on well on the path to recovery. But is that a, a realistic uh, target? And you've already outlined the steps uh, that need to be taken. But um, uh, when do you think that uh, Sri Lanka will emerge from this uh, dark tunnel? So I think it may take about. I think the, the president was right about three years to really get out of it. Because now this year, as I said, the you know, economy is going to contract by eight or nine percent if you by going by the IMF and the World Bank uh, numbers. Um, it would probably, despite the strong base effects, um, next year is also likely to have negative growth, probably, uh, uh, though the central bank thinks things could bounce back. Um, more, more positively, uh, but if you, it would probably be 20, uh, 20, 24, 25 before GDP gets 
above the level it was in 2021. You see what I mean? Because there's going to be eight to nine percent contraction this year. Yeah. There will be a smaller contraction next year. Then it will take a couple of years to catch up. <clears throat> the you know the 10, 12 percent of contraction that would have taken place over the uh, 2022, 2023 period. So we will kind of get ahead again, uh, probably around 2025. Yeah. Uh, but we will, I mean, but we, one can see an upturn, certainly. I think if one will begin to see an upturn next year when inflation will come down uh, and, and uh, economic activity will pick up. But we'll take, take a bit of time to catch up, to catch up and get ahead of where we were. You know, so we don't have uh, that much time, but I'll ask you um, a couple of uh, questions. Just looking back, you know, how did a country like South uh, Sri Lanka, it, it went through this really uh, brutal civil war and it's, it had no particular uh, difficulty at that time, economic difficulty at that time. Uh, there was one year, I think 2001 perhaps, when um, it, uh, the economy contracted. And, um, but otherwise I think, uh, you know, there was a, generally there was an optimistic, uh, there was an optimism about Sri Lankan economy, um, you know, in internationally as well and within Sri Lanka as well. So what was it that was working then to keep Sri Lanka ticking economically? and you know uh, not have this uh, difficulty and uh, you know it's counterintuitive country huge civil war a lot of defense expenditure but not really a problem otherwise could you could you just tell us yeah what what was working then i think yeah so i think maybe a couple of reasons one is the the hostilities during the 30 years of the conflict period <clears throat> were to a large extent confined to the north and east of the country. There were major incidents in other parts of the country. Yeah, the central bank were... itself was bombed. Of in course, was bombed. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And there were other very, very serious incidents, but they tended to be sporadic. Um, but so, but the sustained conflict was really in the north and the east, basically. And economic activity in the rest of the country did get disrupted, but it tended to bounce back. It was a pretty resilient economy. The Sri Lankan people and the Sri Lankan economy is, on the whole, very resilient. Uh, historically, it has been, and I think it will again prove to be so going forward. Um, but at that time, so that was a one reason, right? It, it was a localized. Um, the disruption was localized most of the time. The second thing is, <laughs> Sri Lanka enjoyed its demographic dividend during those years. You know, as you know, in the population pyramid, now India is one of the few large countries which has a demographic dividend ahead of it. The others have now have this pyramid has changed with the aging process. Now, at that time, we were enjoying the demographic dividend and you could drive growth through labor augmentation. Right? Through adding people into the labor force, you could drive growth. Today, our population pyramid has started to invert. We are now an aging population. So you can't drive growth as easily simply through labor augmentation. You have to increase productivity. For that, you, know, you need innovation, you need R&D, et cetera. So it's a much more difficult process to drive growth. And we have, at the moment, not being able to adjust to that new paradigm whereby we have where we, we drive growth through you know through increases in productivity. That, that productivity gain has to come. So as far as the recovery from this uh, crisis is concerned, we have to have productivity gain. Sri Lanka historically has had 16 IMF programs, right? For, um, 14 of them were when we were a low-income country and we got very concession, we got bailed out with concessional money, and we kind of took the money and carried on regardless. This time around, you know, we are exposed to capital markets, rating agencies, etc. Much more discipline is required, and the demographic dividend is no longer working for us. So that re the, these reforms, 
we if you look back at the 16 programs the stabilization components were done quite well for a period of time usually till elections came and as soon as elections came the discipline went so it was a repeating cycle this is why we've had 16 of them but under each of those programs if you look the structural reforms which are more difficult which then much more difficult to summon the political will to do them because you have winners and losers and and you know our political system is not good at dealing with losers you know it, it just doesn't have the commitment to go through those reforms and short term political experience trips up the process so this time we have to get it right and we have to do both we have to stabilize the economy and which we have started doing already and progress has been made a little more needs to be done and this time we have to do these structural reforms you know improving the business climate land um, uh, the factor markets land labor and capital we have to modernize those agriculture you know 25% of the labor force gives us 7 8% of gdp we have to modernize our agriculture to in its low productivity low income at the moment so all these things which are very very difficult to do have to be done and have to be done concurrently with the stabilization to get growth going so there is a real test for the sri lankan polity whether they can transform themselves so that they can transform the economy you uh, spoken i was listening to one of your speeches where you said that uh, uh, sri lanka was a donor darling um, of the world and uh, that uh, you know it was the first country uh, from the global south after chile uh, to privatize and uh, there was uh, there was a sense of um, uh, you know there was the sentiment that we have to make sri lanka work somehow in uh, for as a liberalized uh, economy and people and and the international community was generous with its uh, with its funds but will you also throw some light on you know one of the big revelations for uh, for many people in india i think was how import dependent um um uh, sri lanka uh, uh, has been and could you tell us why this is i mean is it a country specific uh, are there any country specific factors is the geography is it the uh, uh, you know topography or uh, what i you know i was looking at the list of imports even fish is imported so what is the what is the reason for this high import dependency so i think if you look back um Sri Lanka essentially had a you know like many countries in the global south in the uh, starting from the 60s through the 70s <coughs> had inward looking import substitution policies and like in many countries they resulted in Sri Lanka ending up in a low gro- low investment low growth high unemployment syndrome that's what happened essentially so then there was a change in direction in 1977 a new government came in and liberalized the economy but the country didn't get the payoff it could have done for two reasons one reason being that the conflict started and there was a very high war risk premium attached to the economy and which meant that opportunities which would have come otherwise did not come sri lanka's way so that was one the, that break the other thing is that the sri lankan polity uh, was not able to function in a way that could avoid macroeconomic stress what we've had really almost from independence macroeconomic stress mostly stemming from the government's fiscal operations in fact professor john robinson who is certainly no neoclassical economist as you know she is you know the cambridge economist from the left she came to sri lanka in 1959 and said you silanese was from then you silanese have eaten the fruit before you planted the tree so th- this is what happened we had a very much a kind of a, a consumption oriented 
model, which was really came out of a, a combination of one, a toxic combination of populist politics and an entrenched entitlement culture amongst the people. These two things fed off each other, you know, in a negative feedback loop and dragged the country down. So because of that, we didn't really, the transformation of the economy didn't take place. Even after the liberalization in 1977, the, liberal, the, 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 the transformation was part, only partial, partly because of the conflict, partly because of this, it's a populist mixture of populist politics and this entitlement culture. We didn't take the hard decisions really to increase productivity, to transform the economy. Um, that transformation is, is still very partial. And it has to be, you know, we have to complete that process if we want to really get out of this hole. Right. So thank you, uh, Dr. Kumar Swami. Now I'm going to um, open the uh, uh, open it to the floor for questions. <coughs> um, and uh, may I call on uh, Bimla Sharma uh, to ask her question, please. Bimla? Uh, yes, good evening, ma'am. Good I'm evening. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, ask your question, please. Uh, yes, India has given its helping hand towards Sri Lanka and China. Can it help? Will it turn into a conflict between the India and China? Uh, so from a, we are asking whether, whether the, the geopolitical factors uh, at play uh, today could result in uh, India and China clashing uh, in Sri Lanka. Is that is that is that the question? Ah uh, yes, yeah. I think that's okay. what the question is. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think the president and others have been clear um, that uh, you know India. I think various more than one president has said that you know India is like family, right? Uh, um, and China is a very good friend. So we need, we need to deal with both countries. We need the support and assistance of both countries. Um, and I think one thing that is, has to be axiomatic in Sri Lankan foreign policy is that Sri Lanka has to be mindful of Sri Lanka, uh, India's strategic interests. That that's, has to be axiomatic. Even the, the ge geography of the region, uh, and given the fact that you know all many of Sri Lanka, India's strategic assets are in the south because of the tensions that are in the north of the country, you know the nuclear program, armaments factories, a lot is in the south. So India will be particularly concerned about what is happening on its southern flank. And Sri Lanka has to be conscious of that and sensitive to that. And taking that into account, I think I think what really has to happen is various structures need to be de developed for confidence building on the strategic side. So that there is a good flow of information at all times between the strategic communities of both countries. And side by side with that, I think Sri Lanka should look for whatever opportunities it can benefit from through its relations with both countries, India and Sri Lanka, India and China. Uh, and uh, China has, it started now, and now, of course, they're having a little bit of a slowdown, but they still have a lot of capital to deploy. And uh, Sri Lanka, where possible, should try to access that capital, but it must also screen the projects that, uh, that are, are undertaken. And, and also right now, I think it has come to the point where both, uh, and the, I think both countries now are beginning to realize it, there should be a pivot from loans to equity as far as China's participation in the Sri Lankan economy is concerned. So, uh, you know, if I can jump in here, I see a lot of people in the chat box of asking, are curious about China, you know, how India and China uh, will uh, looking at, I mean, the same question essentially by uh, Mr. Shubham Kumar and how uh, uh, China has responded to the crisis so far in, um, in, in Sri Lanka. And then, um, uh, and I have a question of my own. You know, very often um, this is, I mean, we have seen in the commentary all through that this has been, this crisis has been attributed to the Chinese debt trap. 
Yet when you look at the figures, the Chinese, um, uh, what is owed to the Chinese by Sri Lanka is not, uh, is, uh, is about as much as uh, is owed to the Japanese, perhaps is just 10% of uh, Sri Lanka's debt, both countries. So what is the, can, can you explain what this Chinese debt trap is? Are there numbers that we are not seeing? Are, they, are, are there hidden numbers within these loans um, that China has given that we are not seeing? Well, you know, as far as I know, this narrative um, on the Chinese debt trap is unfounded. Um, you know, as you say, it's only 10% of the debt stock. And if you look at the flow in terms of debt servicing, it gets closer to 20%. But certainly it is not the, not the full explanation of Sri Lanka's debt crisis. But there are some lessons we need to learn as the recipient country, and not just in terms of loans from China, but loans from anybody. We need to screen them very carefully to make sure that those projects either earn or save for enough foreign exchange to be able to service the debt and give the economy a, a decent rate of return. So that's one thing, that the, 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 the screening of the projects needs to be very, very rigorous, wherever it comes from, China or anybody else. And you have to avoid white elephants and prestige projects and things like that. That's one lesson to be learned. Um, and and, and, the, and the, the second lesson is, and this is really linked to that really, in the past, Sometimes these projects have been in the non-tradable sector. It's the same thing. I'm saying again, really, in a different way. You have to get tradables uh, uh, supported by these projects where borrowing has taken place abroad. Uh, so that essentially that's it. Yeah, we. I mean, we need to take advantage of uh, the capital China may be able to offer to us. It's better for us now to look look for it by 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 in the form of equity. Uh, but uh, we need to screen screen the investments to make sure they're uh, in the country, Sri Lanka's interest. Okay, thanks. May I now ask uh, Mr. Suresh Chand Sharma to ask his question? Uh, good evening, sir. Good uh, evening. Hi, how are you? Very nice. We have uh, received from you a very authentic uh, understanding of uh, the development dynamics and uh, how the central bank of the country has tried to salvage the situation. Sir, my question is that when we were students, we used to read about the Sri Lankan experience and case studies were number one in the world. Human development index was uh, extolled and everybody said that look per capita consumption of detergents I am in Sri Lanka and uh, sanitation and education and health, all these parameters were given huge importance and all this should lead to increase in productivity, etc. Now, uh, even when we were looking at the television, uh, we found that the average representative health of a Sri Lankan was far better than many of uh, the other countries and including India. So, Will we call it some kind of emphasis on populism or politics, or there is now a shift from that kind of uh, strategy for development to another strategy where we move to privatization, enhanced level of uh, foreign investment. And then we are today now saying that the recipient countries should also be careful about what they are receiving and the terms and conditions. So this people-oriented development strategy that was followed in 70s and 80s, which brought uh, Sri Lanka to, uh, to, to, I will say, a very respectable position in the Committee of Nations. Uh, so how do you think we will be able to carry out structural reforms now? And what would be the major impediments to achieve these structural reforms? Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. Um, yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. Of course, Sri Lanka has much wanted social indicators and its performance on the Human Development Index is such that it punches way above its weight. Um, and, you know, I, 
Mr. Subramaniam uh, pointed out that Sri Lanka, uh, I had this, described it as a donor darling, that it got lots of foreign aid because the traditional donors wanted to demonstrate good development outcomes in a country with a liberal poverty and a liberal economy after 77. Um, and that lot of that aid was used to build up our social indicators. Um, this, this, this actually was, the, I think, the positive side of democracy because people, the, the politician used um, that assistance not as efficiently as it could have been, but they did use it to improve the social indicators of the people. Uh, so that, you know, you know for, as, as a part of the objective of getting reelected or whatever it is, right? So that, that dynamic that is associated with democracy actually helped Sri Lanka to have good social indicators. So we got quite a lot of foreign aid coming in and that was used to improve our social indicators. And the politics also worked in such a way that it supported that process. Now, the, and there is no reason why we should undermine that process now. But what is happening now is that, you know, the, the cost of health systems, of science education, etc., is increasing all the time. And, and, and the government of Sri Lanka does not, is not generating enough revenue to be able to support the health system and, and the education system as it needs to be supported to take advantage of all the modern techniques uh, um, that are available. So that's why the country has now, uh, in, particularly on the health side, has relied increasingly on private provision. And even on the tertiary education side, there is some uh, private provision that has come in. That is one thing. But why, you know, wh what, where you can call into question Sri Lanka's development model is whether we got the balance between social development and growth right. Did we, did we get that balance right? Did we go too far on the side of social development and didn't create the proper environment proper incentives for driving growth. I'll, I'll give you one example. For instance, the exchange rate in Sri Lanka was consistently overvalued, right? And, and that was to bring in cheap imports for primarily the urban population, right? Because the urban population is the segment of the population that's most noisy. Now, when you do that, when the exchange rate is overvalued, you are subsidizing foreign producers at the expense of domestic producers, right? Because the exporters are disincentivized by an exchange rate that is overvalued. Equally, people who are producing import competing goods are disadvantaged also because imports are made cheaper than they would otherwise be if, you know, by having an overvalued exchange rate. So we have consistently had an overvalued exchange rate, right? Which which basically made Sri Lankan producers run 120 meters in a 100 meter race, race, whereas the foreign producers were running 90 meters. So that kind of policy distortion was there throughout because we were trying to get cheap, cheap imports for the urban population. There are other things, that the way the tariff system worked also didn't, didn't work in favor of actual, in fact, the most dynamic component of the international trading system in the last 15, 20 years is, is, is are these um, cross-border production sharing networks, you know, these uh, so supply chains um, uh, that uh, cross, cross borders. Now, in that system, the distinction between exports and imports gets blurred. You bring in some material, you do your little bit, and you send it out, right? Now, if you put a para tariff in the middle, you become uncompetitive. So Sri Lanka had these para tariffs in the middle, which meant that it did not have, it had very, very limited penetration of these global supply chains because it made itself uncompetitive. So you, we, we knocked ourselves out of the most dynamic component of the international trading system through that 
policy. So these are some of the distortions that we created in the economy, which made, you know, which kind of made the local production uncompetitive. You ask why we are importing so much? Because it threw various policies which made our domestic production uncompetitive. We, rely, we made imports cheaper uh, or more accessible. Uh, and that's, that's something that we need to change. So uh, that kind of answers a couple of questions here. One by Ankit Singh, uh, who wants to, to know uh, what is the way out to increase revenue while not compromising on welfare spending? And uh, he also has another question, um, which uh, says, IMF's working paper on inflation dynamics since the onset of the 21st century contests the relationship between inflation and inflation and employment. Please contextualize this in the case of South Asia. Okay, I, I may might need a little bit of help on the second, but let me first answer the first one. The, the um, you know, the problem on the revenue side, uh, you know, before, until the mid 1990s, Sri Lanka collected over 20% of GDP as revenue. Now, even before the, the, the pandemic and the current crisis, revenue had come down to 12, 13% of GDP. And expenditure was up around 20. Now, after the tax cuts and the pandemic, the reduction in economic activity we do with the pandemic, revenue is 8% of GDP. And expenditure is still 20. Now, the reason why revenue started going down from the mid 90s was because, as I said, there was a high water risk premium attached to the Sri Lankan economy. And in order to help investors get over their hurdle rate of return, the government, successive government, felt obliged to give them tax exemptions. So we gave away large amounts of tax through these exemptions. And, and that is one of the reasons. Now, now I think that new tax reforms which will be introduced, I'd be very surprised if they don't do away with all the really they should, or most of these exemptions, because we simply can't afford it. And the empirical evidence, I mean, the survey evidence shows that if you ask a foreign investment, is a tax break important? They say yes. But if you ask them to rank what is what? What are the important determinants of their investment decisions or location of investment decisions? Tax comes way, way down the line. Much higher up is macro stability, political stability, ease of doing business, all those things, right? But because it was thought that tax exemptions are right, then it was easy, right? You say, okay, we give you a tax exemption. You didn't have to reform labor laws. You didn't have to, uh, uh, you know, make. Uh, tax administration more efficient, all these other things which are necessary and more, more difficult to do and, and also often um, uh, attack the vested interests of particular groups in society, much easier to say, okay, we'll give you a tax holiday. It's an easy option. But it meant that the revenue base was totally eroded. You know, there, there, there is a saying in Sri Lanka that we want uh, Scandinavian type social welfare and a Hong Kong rate of tax. Hong Kong has a 10% tax rate. I mean, that doesn't add up, it just doesn't add up. So we have to pay more tax. And also our tax structure has to be improved. Over 80% of our tax revenue comes from indirect taxes. As you know, indirect taxes are regressive. The richest person in the country and the poorest person in the country pay the same rate. So we need to have a more progressive tax system. More direct taxation needs to be collected. And we have to also collect more tax. I mean, we have no choice but to do that now. But sadly, to make these changes at a time when the economy is contracting, that makes it very challenging. Makes it very challenging. So I don't know. Did I answer that question properly? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, okay. The next question is from uh, Siddharth uh, Chaturvedi. Um, Mr. Chaturvedi, can you please ask your question? Mr. Siddharth, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot to the Indian Express team for organizing this very important chat. First of all, and thanks a lot to Mr. Kumar Swami. This has been really, really very engaging and very enriching. Um, so, so my question was uh, more sectoral and not as macroeconomic. I wanted to understand from you um, that you spoke about structural reforms, you spoke about policy reforms, and then there's also looming uh, crisis, which is a kind of a global crisis around uh, the food crisis due to the war in Ukraine, which is already going on. And as development professionals, we are trying to work, um, meander our way through this and maneuver our way through this to actually help the smallholder farmers through either digital agriculture or mechanization or other innovations that you spoke about. So my, my question is sir, that what is the synergy or what that you see the central bank or the enabling environment that's, that the central bank can create for such small, uh, smaller efforts or initiatives to start to really make a dent that's one. And what are some of the policy bottlenecks you see that may come into the picture? So it's specific to agriculture. You did speak about productivity, sir. Um, but I think one of the leaps that perhaps Sri Lanka would also have to make is from uh, food security to nutrition security as well. So it's, it's kind of a longish and meandered question, sir. Sorry for that. But uh, I'm just trying to encompass uh, what could be some of the roles that and what is uh, what are some of the things that uh, we can so that the results are catalytic rather than just pilots? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Now, let me say first that, as I said, given uh, the, the the numbers that I gave you, agriculture modernization has to be at the top of the. The, uh, the agenda for the real economy as far as Sri Lanka is concerned going forward. Now, the president has spoken of this also. He has uh, placed a lot of, President Vikramasinghe has placed a lot of uh, priority to agricultural modernization. You know, I see there are four areas where policy intervention can take place, right? Now, as far as the central bank is concerned, the best thing it can do is to contain inflation. If it can keep inflation at the target range of 4 to 6%, ideally at the bottom end of it, 4%, that would actually create a much better facilitating environment for agriculture uh, development. That's one. Uh, the second thing, uh, as far as the central bank uh, can do, is in the whole area of financial literacy. Um, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka has, I think, six regional offices, and it does a lot of work in terms of financial literacy and microfinance. Um, so that is another area where uh, to have a well-regulated <coughs> microfinance industry, which doesn't, doesn't lead to exploitative uh, operations. Uh, th so those are two things the Central Bank can do directly. But more broadly, I think as far as uh, smallholder agriculture uh, um, is concerned. Um, you know, there are four areas where one can needs to make sure there is effective and efficient intervention. One is training. So there should be sufficient training in whatever area it is, whether it is uh, whatever, whatever crop the, the people are cultivating or whether it's livestock or whatever. So training is one area. The second thing is to help the smallholders get their inputs, whether it's seeds, fertilizer, uh, or chicks, or carbs, or whatever it is, right? To help with the, with the inputs. And the third is financing, to make sure that there are financing arrangements available, uh, which are user-friendly as far as the smallholder agriculture is concerned. I don't believe in the heavy subsidies and things like that, uh, but I do think that the interest rate should be kept down through solid macroeconomic fundamentals and people should have access to finance uh, and there should be other financial literacy and other things to help them to get that. But the most 
complex of the four inter- level, areas of intervention, right? Training, inputs, financing. Most complex is marketing. If you clear the marketing channel, then you get, you know, the half or three quarters of the problem is solved. Because what we need is to get uh, uh, the, the, you know, the small farmers linked to supply chains, linked to supply chains in, in, in their particular region, linked to national supply chains, linked to global supply chains. So this is the most, for me, the most crucial part is to find ways and means of helping the small farmer get his product to market. Because once you channel, clear the marketing channel, finance will come. You know, banks, if banks see a, a good marketing arrangement, they will be willing to give the money. And equally, you know, you can do that with that money, get your inputs, training, et cetera, all can come. But the marketing is the most intractable problem. And that for that, I think you can, one, one needs to hook these farmers into, into as I said, supply chains. And also, I think you need to make sure um, that they, that the, the, you know, the um, exploitation, you know, that they wherever possible, they're, they're not exploited uh, through either the uh, financial providers uh, or, or other other intermediary agents operating uh, in the agricultural ecosystem. I think you're muted. Uh, Sorry. Nirpuma. Yeah, that yeah. answers a question in the chat box about how, uh, you know, agriculture can be a game changer by Sham Sundur. Um, I will go on to, there's one Mr. Shivakumaran Vipulananda who wants to know if the um, current interest rate policy to curb inflation um, uh, isn't it causing a contract, possible contraction of private enterprises-led economic growth? And will that not become counterproductive uh, in alleviating the suffering of the people? Um, that is uh, one question. And um, uh, yeah, that's one question. Maybe if you can answer that quickly. Okay. And then maybe yeah. Then, yeah. So yes, certainly the high interest rates are contributing to economic contraction. But in hyperinflation, we are already on the verge of hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is actually even worse. You know, if we slip into hyperinflation, you know, the the the, the impact on businesses, large and small, would be much worse than what we are experiencing now through the high interest rates. In fact, the governor of the central bank, Dr. Nandalal Veer Singh, just last week answer the question at his press conference, his monetary policy press conference, they have calculated that the finance costs uh, across various enterprises um, is between 5 to 10%, right? So 95 to ni- 90 to 95% are other costs, like wages, transport, inputs, etc. Now, if you have hyperinflation, that 90, 90 to 95% of the cost, cost structure will keep going up, right? So that would be far more destructive than the high interest rates you need to make sure that inflation doesn't keep going back, going up and that you pull inflation back. Because you know hyperinflation is a destructive Everybody, it hits everybody, businesses of all sides and everybody. So you can't allow that to happen. And that is the primary job of a central bank. You know, and also inflation is highly iniquitous because wealthy people have assets which tend to appreciate in value with inflation, which acts as somewhat of a hedge. Poor people have no such assets. So it is very pernicious in that it has a disproportionately negative impact on poor people inflation. So the number one job of a central bank is to keep inflation down. And when you have it, when you're in a country that when inflation is running at 70%, that has to be the first preoccupation of the central bank to bring inflation down towards its target range. It will take time, but towards its target range and do whatever it takes to do that first. 
because if inflation spins out of control, the damage is going to be far worse than anything we're seeing now. I think you're muted, uh, Nirupama. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Ashok Kanta, uh, who was the uh, High Commissioner to uh, Sri Lanka, India's High Commissioner to Sri Lanka. And he's asking, what do you think of the viability of the Colombo Port City project? Does it pass your screening test when 43% of reclaimed land was given to promoters on long-term lease and various tax concessions are taken into account? Um, anyway, I must, I must uh, read Mr. Kanta. I remember his time in Colombo. Um, it is, um, let me put it this way. It is a project that has considerable potential. Um, because, you know, as I said, our roots are over millennia are of Sri Lanka being a trading hub in the middle of the Indian Ocean. That's what Sri Lanka has been for millennia. Now, this port city, if it's developed well uh, and uh, the projects are screened well and good quality investors are attracted from all over the world, particularly India. Interestingly, I must tell you that the, the company that uh, is developing port city, uh, the, they spoke to me while I was in the central bank a couple of times. And the main message they gave to me was, can you help us to attract Indian investors into Port City? That's what they wanted me to do, you know, uh, while I was in that seat in the central bank. So that, that's, I think we need investment from all over the world. We need particularly India um, because it's convenient for India. Um, and, uh, and you know, Sri Lanka, the services sector has potential for Sri Lanka. The location, um, as, as I said, have, enables us to be a kind of a, a hub. Um, and and this project kind of you know feeds into those narratives, but it must be implemented very rigorously, applying. Um, as I said, the most uh, disciplined uh, approach to project evaluation and uh, and uh, uh, implementation. We'll take uh, the next question from Mr. Vikrant Jadav. Uh, Mr. Jadav, can you please ask your question? Actually, we are we are in connect with uh, Sri Lanka since last many years with some business with some herbal business. What uh, there is a question in mind of every person. So, what will be the future of ours? Because there are some farmers and some traders over here who are the onion traders. They are not uh, recovering means uh, INR more than uh, two CR has been stuck up over there. And herbal business is there. At the same time, we see that the travel over there has been reduced a lot. Obviously, Sri Lanka had uh, recently, they have done it the uh, uh, best way in Hyderabad, Delhi, about the travel, which they have lost. But uh, what is the future? Because this is to be understood by the people of India. And basically, the travelers, traders, herbal people, medicinal people, and what type of investment may be good at this time in Colombo and adjacent areas? So I think um, clearly right at this moment, the investment climate is very challenged. That's, that's for sure. But these various measures that uh, I hope I've been able to convey to you, which are being um, implemented by the government and also the various things that the private sector in Sri Lanka itself is doing. As I said, the Sri Lankan private sector has over the years been very resilient. It has lived through some very tough times. Uh, and here again, this is a challenge they will have to meet. Um, you know, I personally see this as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an opportunity 
for almost a fresh beginning, that Sri Lanka will open itself up for integration with the region and the wider world. That, you know, we have a great opportunity. India is going to, most observers, most commentators say that India is going to have be the fastest growing large economy over the last, over the next 10 years. <clears throat> and then the second point is the neighborhood first policy. And I, 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 I see the 4.8 billion uh, support India gave to Sri Lanka as part of that neighborhood first policy. Third, third thing is, historically, you know, we have had proximity forever, right? We have been in that neighborhood 20 miles apart uh, from the beginning of time. However, the infrastructure in both countries has tended to be very poor until recently. So the transaction cost of doing cross-border business has been high. But now roads are improving, rail tracks are improving, uh, ports are improving, airports are improving in both countries. Transaction costs are coming down and therefore the prospects for cross-border investment and cross-border business is being improved. So you take these, and one other thing, I've seen Mr. Modi speak about making India a hub a global hub for supply chains to you know basically replace components of what is coming out of china so if that is the case if you look at what happened when japan and then china took off in east asia all the countries in the in that region in east and southeast asia benefited by linking into the supply chains that were created by the growth of Japan and China. So now if India becomes a global hub for supply chains, there has to be opportunities for countries in the region as well. So, you know, I think they call this wild geese formation. You know, one of the head lead geese goes up and everybody else follows. So I think that opportunity is out there as well. So in various ways, as I said, the different elements are working in the favor of Sri Lanka integrating better with the region, particularly India. And also at the same time, uh, Sri Lanka is now uh, trying to implement the Singapore Free Trade Agreement, which it signed a few years ago. It's also working to strengthen ETCA, the Economic uh, and Technical Cooperation Agreement with India, its Free Trade Agreement with China. It's trying to start one with uh, Thailand and Bangladesh, I think. So there is a I hope a change in attitude away from this inward looking orientation we've had to an open orient, open, much more outward looking orientation. Um, and we take advantage of these things that are going on around us in India, I mean, neighborhood first, um, the, 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 what do you call it? The, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, better infrastructure, the, uh, uh, the, uh, I think we are also, I think, as I said, the, um, the supply chain, global supply chain hub uh, uh, phenomenon that is being pursued in India, all that taken together, I think will create new opportunities. So whether you're traders or whatever you are, whether you're in, in, in medicinal herbs, whatever, if there is a much more open orientation to Sri Lankan policy and uh, there's an effort made to to basically uh, facilitate trade. Because you know, the Indo-Sri Lanka Free Trade Agreement had a number of drawbacks, number of uh, impediments. And if in the process of moving towards an economic and technical cooperation agreement, some of those things can be resolved and new areas can be identified and built upon, I think the future has great, great potential, great potential for Indian, Indian businessmen to operate in Sri Lanka and for Sri Lankan businessmen to operate in India. There's one uh, more question uh, that's come up from Yamini Sikwera, and she's asking if the recent UNHCR resolution will impact further financial support for Sri Lanka from, uh, from the international community. 
you know, I'm, um, I hope not. Uh, I, I think uh, that re the UNHCR report has raised some very important issues. Uh, and the government of Sri Lanka, I hope, will respond to those. Um, um, but equally, I, I hope um, that that report will not compromise in any way uh, the effort that the international community um, should make in helping Sri Lanka come out of this crisis. So on that note, Dr. Kumar Swami, there are many, many questions. Even I want to ask some questions and there are questions in the chat box that are still coming up, but I think um, we can't hold you anymore. Uh, you've spoken for uh, more than an hour and a half. So uh, I, uh, I think it's time to end the session. Thank you so very much for this very engaging, fascinating, uh, you know, um, uh, explanations that you have given uh, for the crisis, for all the uh, answers that you've given to all the questions that were asked. And, um, and I hope we will be able to host you uh, at another session, maybe when the economy is uh, improving somewhat, and we can talk about that. And I would uh, uh, also like to um, uh, thank the audience, which was very active and asking very many questions, and um, um, and also our partner, Yojna IAS. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, thanks for joining us and making this session um, very lively. And, uh, um, you know, uh, it brought forth a lot of information. Thank you all very much. Good night. Good night, Dr. Kumaraswam. Thank you very much. Thank you to you and also to the audience. And uh, I hope they found it useful and helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yojna is offering new batches for 2023, 2024, 2025. We are offering online and offline class English and Hindi medium. Our features are experienced faculties, mentorship program, doubt session and test series, online and offline mock test, current affair classes, study material and mock interview. Contact us on 8595390705 for more details. Visit on www.yojnais.com. Yojna is offering new batches for 2023, 2024, 2025. We are offering online and offline class English and Hindi medium. Our features are experienced faculties, mentorship program, doubt session and test series, online and offline mock test, current affair classes, study material and mock interview. Contact us on 8595390705 for more details. Visit on www.yojnais.com.